Okay. Well, brethren, I'll ask this question just one more time. Are you a big loser? How have you been doing the past couple of months since I began this series of sermons on becoming a big loser? Have you been losing the sin that so easily besets you? You know, we've already kept the Days of Unleavened Bread, so that was certainly a reminder of what we've been talking about, about losing the sin. Days of Unleavened Bread obviously pictures coming out of sin, putting the leaven out, the sin out of our lives. Have you been shedding the weight of sin that drags you down spiritually? Again, you might remember I said before, I don't care if you are the biggest loser, but I do want every one of you to be a big loser. Now the contestants on the Biggest Loser program all lost a lot of physical weight, and I went through a lot of that weight in, in an earlier sermon, some of them losing nearly 200 pounds. They were all big losers, however, every single one of them. Now, from a, a spiritual perspective, we also need to be big losers. So this is a vital subject, and as we look back on the Days of Unleavened Bread, let's ask ourselves, are we following these seven principles that will enable us to put the sin out of our lives? Are you determined to lose the weight, the sin that does pull you down? What will God the Father and Jesus Christ, your Savior, do to help you along? Uh, certainly, we all need help in putting sin out of our lives. And what can you also do to aid in losing the weight, the sin, and to become spiritually lean and fit? So today, I intend to conclude this series on becoming a big loser. Now, we've covered four of the seven principles for losing the weight the sin that so easily ensnares us and enslaves us. Today we're going to cover the last three principles while quick, quickly reviewing the first four. So if you missed any of the first two sermons, I will review them very quickly now. So we're, gonna, we're going to be talking about seven principles for losing the weight, the sin that easily besets us. The first principle was we all need to trust, listen to, and follow our coaches. Just on the TV program where they have physical coaches, uh, we have some spiritual coaches, and of course, our ultimate coaches are God the Father and Jesus Christ, and they're far more than coaches. I hope you know I understand that. Uh, they are everything to us. They guide us, they direct us, they show us the way. So God the Father and Jesus Christ are the big ultimate coaches, but God also has selected human beings to also lead us and guide us. And we should be willing to, to follow those who are following God. Now the contestants on The Biggest Loser, again, they follow the lead of their coaches. And as a result, they're very successful in losing physical weight. Every one of them lost a great deal of weight. They were all big losers. Now when we follow God the Father and Jesus Christ, as well as those human leaders who love God, love his people, and also keep the commandments of God, then we too will lose the sin that easily besets us. If we'll follow God's instructions, if we'll keep his commandments, do those things that are pleasing in his sight, then we are well on the way to losing the sin that easily besets us. And of course, we know that Christ died for us, and it's through his sacrifice that our sins are forgiven in the first place. Now, secondly, a second principle in losing the weight is we must all admit that we have a sin problem. We all have a weight problem. You have a weight problem. I have a weight problem. If we can't admit that, then that is a huge problem. We have to be able to admit that none of us are yet perfect and that we all have a serious weight problem. Now, those on the Biggest Loser program all knew that they had a serious weight problem. That's why they applied for the program in the first place. They understood it was pretty simple for them to, to consider they had a weight problem. For us, spiritually, perhaps it's not as easy, although it should be in many respects, because we all fall short of God's glory. You know, we are not perfect by any stretch. So those on the Biggest Loser program they all applied to be on the program so it would help them lose the weight 
that was pulling them down and affecting their lives in negative ways. Now, we also need to admit that we have a serious weight problem. We all need to have repentant hearts and minds if we are to put sin out and keep it out. We are to examine ourselves, and certainly during the Passover season, we have looked at ourselves and examined ourselves. And we also, of course, need to confess our sins, seeking repentance and forgiveness through the sacrifice of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's the second principle, admit that you have a problem with sin. We all do. Thirdly, a third principle in putting the weight out and off is that we need to fully commit to losing the weight. We have to make a commitment. It has to be a firm commitment and we have to lose the weight, the sin, no matter what the cost. We have to be willing to pay the price. So this must become priority number one is seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, becoming like him. Again, the contestants on The Biggest Loser all need to commit fully to losing their excess physical weight and then keeping it off. There has to be a commitment, otherwise the weight wouldn't come off. How much more should we commit fully to repenting of our sins, accepting Christ as our Savior and putting the sin out and keeping it out of our lives? Remember last time we talked about Elisha's complete and total commitment when he sacrificed his oxen on his burning plow. And then he went to become a prophet of the Most High God. He answered the call. Now we are all, be, all being called as well. Now we're not all being called to be prophets, but we're all being called by God and we must also answer the call. We must be totally committed to answering the call that God has given us. So don't look back Keep your hand to the plow. Look forward and keep your eyes on the kingdom of God. This is our goal. We are marching toward the kingdom together. And that's the third principle. Commit fully to losing the weight, the sin, no matter what. And the fourth principle that we discussed last time was to exercise spiritually on a daily basis to lose the weight, the sin, and to keep it off. We have to exercise spiritually on a daily basis if we're going to ever lose the weight, the sin that easily besets us. Now I mentioned last time that the contestants on The Biggest Loser, they exercised four hours every day. I mean, that was their routine. Four hours of hard exercise every day. They also did a triathlon where they ran, they biked, and they swam. Now I suggested that we all go on a continual spiritual quadrathlon. Remember that word, quadrathlon? It basically means four events as opposed to a triathlon, which only means three. And those four spiritual events are praying. We all need to be praying continually. We need to learn to pray three times a day, like Daniel and David did. That's the example that we see in the Bible. They prayed three times a day to God. And of course, Paul talks about going beyond that to learn to pray without ceasing, to have this kind of a prayerful attitude and approach throughout the entire day. The second part of the spiritual quadrathlon was to study the Bible, God's word. So we should be studying the Bible daily because it is, it is through Bible study that we really get to know God's mind and we draw nearer to God. We understand his thinking we understand what he expects of us. We understand what he wants of us. So we need to study the Bible. We need to put the word of God into our hearts and into our minds. Thirdly, I talked about meditation and the importance of meditating, again, on a regular basis. I may have mentioned as I grow older, I meditate more because I wake up early in the morning and I don't necessarily want to get out of bed. You know, I'm waking up at 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning and I don't necessarily want to get, get out of bed. So that's the perfect time to meditate, to think about God, to think about his truth, to think about his way of life. But I've tried to make it a practice for many, many years now to, to meditate continually throughout the day. You know, as employees, we get challenged from time to time on certain things and if we're in if we're in the process or in the habit of meditating 
on God's ways, we'll come up with better answers to those challenges that face us. So I would encourage you to develop a habit of meditating throughout the day on God's way and ask yourself, how pleasing am I to God as I go about my daily business? Whether it's at work or at home, wherever you might be, out on the golf course, how pleasing are you to God? Are you doing it his way or are you doing it your way? If we will meditate more, we'll draw closer to God, we'll understand his mind better. So we should be meditating continually on the things of God. And the fourth part of that was fasting. Now this is a spiritual power tool. Prayer and fasting are both spiritual power tools. Some things don't happen except by prayer and fasting. So we need to be fasting on a regular basis. Uh, the Bible doesn't tell us how often we should fast. But Christ did say that when he was crucified and went to his father, that his disciples would fast. And I don't think he was talking about solely on the day of atonement. I think he was talking about having a habit of fasting throughout the year. So that's the spiritual quadrathlon, prayer, Bible study, meditation, and fasting. Now let's go on to a fifth principle, something new for us to think about, not brand new because these are basic principles that hopefully we've been practicing for a long time now. And the fifth principle in being able to put sin out of your life is to eat only good, spiritually healthy food. Eat only good, spiritually healthy food. Now it's a proven fact that that physical food that is not healthy for you is unhealthy. It's not good for you. Uh, and it will take a toll on your body. So when we choose to eat things that aren't healthy for us, uh, you know, we choose to, to pay the price to some degree. Some, sometimes it's not much of a price. It tastes good and it's not immediate. So we decide to, to uh, do that, which, you know, that's, we all do that. But we shouldn't be naive to think that it's healthy for us. Now, it's really not healthy. But it's critical that from a spiritual standpoint, we make the right decisions. It's not so important from a physical standpoint, perhaps, but it is very, very important from a, from a spiritual standpoint. We can't afford to be bringing in a lot of spiritual junk food. Now, you can get away with some physical junk food, but the spiritual junk food is something that you need to be able to identify and reject. So this fifth point is to eat only good, spiritually healthy food. And one of the finest scriptures that we could turn to in this regard is Philippians chapter 4. This has always been one of my favorite scriptures because I've seen the importance of it and I've seen the power in it for many, many years. When I came into the church, I was only 18. And at that time, I realized that my heart was deceitful above all things. It was desperately wicked because I had a human heart. And Satan would try to infiltrate that heart and that mind by broadcasting his ways. He is the prince of the power of the air. And so we are always being bombarded by ungodly thoughts. I mean, I mean, I, I shouldn't say always being bombarded, but fairly regularly, Satan tries to bombard us with these spiritual, these spiritually unhealthy, evil thoughts. Philippians 4.8 gives us some very sound advice in dealing with this kind of temptation because that's exactly what it is. It's temptation. So we have to recognize it for what it is and we have to, to say no to this temptation. Philippians chapter four, verse eight. And, and actually this point is, is the positive aspect. Uh, point number six will be the negative aspect. This is eat only good spiritually healthy food. Put it into your heart, put it into your mind. That's what we need to be doing with principle number five is putting it in. So here's what verse eight says. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, it's telling us what to think about, what to meditate on. Whatever things are true, if it's not true, don't think about it. Don't dwell on it. It's unhealthy. 
Whatever things are noble, if something's the opposite of noble, why are we thinking about it? Why are we dwelling upon it? That type of thing leads to gossip. You know, so don't be thinking about things that are ignoble, that are unnoble, that are against God. Think about those things that are noble. Think about the things that are just, that are right and good, things that are pure. Don't be thinking about things that aren't pure. Whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue, and if there is anything that's praiseworthy, then meditate on these things. That's principle number five. You have to be very selective in what you think about all day long. You cannot afford to allow Satan to put his thoughts into your mind. You've got to reject those thoughts and you have to be proactive by first putting in the good things. Because if, if you've got lots of good things going in, it's much harder for Satan to interject his evil things. So make the right choice from the beginning. Reject those things that are bad. That'll be the next point. But meditate on those things which are good. So here's a little acronym that I want you to remember. GSI. GSO. GSI, GSO. Do you know what it stands for? Good stuff in, good stuff out. If you bring the good stuff in, you're going to get the good stuff out. GSI, GSO. Good stuff in, good stuff out. Philippians 4 8 is that's all good things. Think on those things that are pure and lovely and are right and good and noble. Those are good things. That's good stuff. If you think on that, that's what you will produce. That's the kind of fruit that you'll be producing in your life. And you will not have an opportunity to get weighed down by sin if you are thinking only on good things. At the Biggest Loser Ranch, the contestants are taught to eat good, healthy, nutritious food. Okay, they are taught to eat these things that are healthy for them. Things like lean meats, lots of veggies, only healthy carbs. These are the things that are put on the table before them. That's the kind of food that is served at the ranch. So we need to do the same thing in a spirit, as spiritual. Our banquet should be spiritually good things. Eat the things that are right and good, not the spiritual junk food. Because Satan would like us to, to banquet on those things that are evil. Those things that are contrary, that are not noble, that are bad, that are evil for us. So meditate on the things that are right and good. I remember Holly, in the, uh, one of the contestants on the Biggest Loser program, Holly said, I can do anything that I put my mind to. Now that reminds me of something that's said in, uh, by Paul. Uh, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. So if we put on the mind of Christ, then we're thinking about good things, aren't we? Philippians 2 verse 5, put on the mind of Jesus Christ. That's a pure mind. So think on these things, think on the things that Christ would think about, and you can do all things through Christ who strengthens you. I remember Jennifer, who was another contestant, she said, I, I know there's been a change on the outside she was talking about the physical weight coming off. I know there's been a change on the outside, but even more change on the inside because she was beginning to think differently about herself. She was beginning to make better choices. She was eating better foods. She was exercising more. She was starting to do the things that would make a difference in helping her reach a goal of putting the physical weight out. Now, if you have a goal of putting... The, the sin out of your life, then, then, you, then you have to change your thinking from the inside. Okay, you have to clean yourself up and God's actually the one that does it by living in you. Remember what Galatians 2 verse 20 says about Christ lives in me. In the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So we need to put Christ in. So this fifth step in the process of conversion or in putting sin out of our lives 
you can label this a lot of different ways here. These seven principles put us on the road to God's kingdom. You know, they really do help us uh, clean ourselves up and, and, and do the right thing. So the fifth step in the process of putting sin out and keeping it out is to eat only good, spiritually healthy food. Just like you need to be careful about the physical choices that you make. You should be eating lots of good food. You know, don't stock up on the junk food. Uh, and we will have some here. You know, it's, it's junk food, let's face it. It's not really that healthy for us. You better be eating more of the good stuff than the, than the other stuff. From a spiritual standpoint, it, standpoint, it's even much more important to stay away from the, the, you know, the spiritual junk food. So let's eat only good, spiritually healthy food. That's principle number five. Principle number six, as I said before, is the opposite of what we just talked about in the sense of before we, we were proactive about bringing in only good things. Now let's be proactive in avoiding all the bad stuff. So I made it two, two points because I think it's important to get, to get this concept from both angles. We have to also avoid all the bad stuff, the weight gaining thoughts. We have to focus on all the good things, but we also have to say no. You know, when it comes to exercise, there are different types of exercise. And I, I should have looked this up, but there, there are certain exercises where you resist, you know, and that makes you stronger. It's not just lifting weights. You know, that's, that's good, but there's another part where you resist things. You know, you, uh, I don't, again, I need to look this up so the next time I give this sermon, I'll sound more educated. But uh, there are certain, there are different types of exercises and you need to learn to spiritually exercise by resisting Satan. Scripture says in James that if we resist Satan, he will flee from us. So we have to resist him. We have to put up a resistance. Now, <clears throat> now there's another acronym which you've heard before. It's G-I-G-O, garbage in, garbage out. You've heard that, right? I like to also add another one, um, B-S-I, B-S-O. It's a lot of B-S, but B-S-I, B-S-O, that's bad stuff in, bad stuff out. You know, if you put the bad stuff in, you're going to get the bad stuff out. Garbage in, garbage out. That's something that's been used in the computer field, I think, for a long time. If you, if you input something into your computer that's not accurate, then you're not going to get the good stuff out. You know, you're going to get the garbage. It's not going to be accurate. It's not going to be right. Now, you won't find all the candy bars, the chocolates, the cakes, the pies, the cookies, the cinnamon rolls, the greasy foods, the french fries. You won't find that on the Biggest Loser Ranch. It's not there. <laughs> In order to be a, bigger, a, be a big loser, you really can't have all that bad stuff around. It doesn't work. You have to resist it. You have to put it away. Uh, you know, you can only imagine if, if every day after they exercise for four hours, they had piles and piles of chocolate and ice cream, <laughs> every imaginable variety of ice cream, uh, you know, scrumptious, scrumptious everything that was decadent. <laughs> you know, if they tanked up on all that, they would minimize the effects of the exercise that they just did. You know, they'd have to exercise more. But if they ate good, lean foods and powerful foods that would give them energy, good carbs, good things like that, vegetables, those types of things, it would be much more effective. So in order to avoid sin, you must really learn to hate sin and see clearly the devastating danger, danger and damage that it's doing to your own personal life and those that you love most in life. You know, you have to look at this logically, realistically. You have to see it for what it is. You have to learn to hate sin if you're ever going to put it out of your lives. In Psalm 97, verse 10, it talks about those who love the Lord will hate evil. Let's go to Psalm 97, written by a man after God's own heart. David had his problems, but he was wholehearted in his approach. 
And notice what he says in Psalm 97, verse 10. He's talking to all of us. He says, you who love the eternal hate evil. Hate evil. He preserves the soul of his saints, souls of his saints. He delivers them out of the hand of the wicked. Light is sown for the righteous and gladness for the upright in heart. Rejoice in the eternal, you righteous, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holy name. He who, he, he who loves the Lord learns to hate evil. He, her, he learns to reject that spiritual junk food that is unhealthy. In Amos chapter 5, the prophet Amos says we need to hate evil. Amos chapter 5, let's go there. Amos Obadiah. It's right before Obadiah, if that'll help you find it. Probably not. Amos chapter 5. Verse 15, Amos says, well, let's go back to verse 14 because this is sound advice that fits in right with this sermon. Seek good and not evil. Point five and point six. Seek good, not evil, that you may live. So the Lord God of hosts will be with you. If you want God to be with you, you have to follow these two points, five and six. Seek good, reject evil. Verse 15, hate evil and love good. Hate evil, love good. Establish justice in the gate. It may be that the Lord God of hosts will be gracious to the remnant of Joseph. So brethren, we need to learn to hate evil and to love that which is good. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, a very powerful verse here that will help you greatly if you will follow the advice given here. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse five. It, it, it fits in very beautifully with this point, this principle of keeping the garbage out. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, well, let's read verse four as well. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, well, let's read verse three as well. Verse three, for though we walk in the flesh, yes, we're all fleshly, right? If we do the pin test, we'll all uh, pass it. We're, <laughs> it'll hurt. If we stick ourselves with a pin, we, we may even draw blood. We'll see that we're all flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal or fleshly, but, they, but our weapons are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Now, what's he talking about? What is a stronghold? Okay, any sin that has a power over you is a stronghold. Anything that you do on a regular basis is a stronghold. Satan has set up a stronghold in your life. So what are some of the strongholds that a person could have? Think about any addiction. Okay, if you're addicted to drugs, that is a stronghold. If drugs have control over you, whether or not if they're prescription drugs or pain medicines that have control over you and you know, they're, they're making you, uh, they're hurting you, then that is a, that's a stronghold. There has to be a balance. I know some people have to take pain medication and it's healthy for them to take it because they have so much pain, they have to do something. But I'm talking about when you're going overboard. You know, some people get addicted and then they just keep doing more of that type of thing. Other types of addictions, uh, pornography is, is an addiction that happens in people's lives. It becomes a stronghold. It gets a grip on someone, and then they, have, they seem almost powerless when it comes to pornography. So that is a stronghold. So we have to be careful that we don't allow any of these strongholds to be set up in our lives. So he's telling us what to do about strongholds. And other strongholds could be, it could be anything. You know, gossip could be a stronghold. If you continually gossip, now that's a stronghold that Satan set up in your life. It's something that you need to resist and that you need to stop doing. So anything like that, uh, gambling could be a stronghold. 
You know, there's, you know, there's lots of gambling that goes on in the world. Oklahoma is filled with, with uh, casinos. You know, I drive by four or five every day. You know, if I'm out dry, if I'm out driving any distance, I'm going by several casinos because there there's like 150 casinos in Oklahoma, and if you if you're addicted to that, that is a stronghold that Satan, that Satan has set up in your life, and it's I've been told it's one of the strongest addictions is gambling. If someone gets this thing, if it gets a hold of them, then they have a difficult time controlling it, and they lose money they don't have. And they get themselves into financial straits. And so gambling could be a stronghold that Satan has set up. We have to be able to recognize strongholds in our lives. And, you know, there's just, just anything like that. What does, what does the Bible tell us to do? He says, the rep weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. So... The key is going back to point five, thinking on things that are noble and right and good and lovely, that are virtuous. That will help you have strength over these strongholds. It will help you cast down arguments in every high thing. I guess that might talk about, sometimes we argue, I'm not sure, this is just something that came to mind. Sometimes we rationalize our behavior. You know, pornography is not so bad. You know, God made the human body you know, rationalize these things that, you know, people play games with. Gambling's not so bad. You know, you can go on and on. These are arguments that we set up in our lives, and they're destructive arguments. This will help you cast down those arguments. There is no argument when it's, if it's unhealthy, if it's ungodly, then strive to find the strength to pull down the stronghold in your life. Casting down arguments at every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Okay, now that is a tall order, bringing every thought into captivity. That's not easy to imprison these thoughts because Satan, if he has a stronghold set up, trust me, he's going to be throwing those thoughts out there. He's going to want to keep his grip on you. So we have to be careful, very careful, that we don't allow that to happen. So we have to bring every thought into captivity. So what does that mean? Okay, if Satan gives, sends you a thought, or you come up with a thought on your own, because we're fully, fully capable of doing that as well, uh, we can do that. If these, no matter what the thought, where it comes from, if it's unhealthy, then you need to imprison that thought. You have to imprison it immediately you have to cast it out, cast it away, and don't allow it to, to get inside your head and get inside your mind or your deceitful heart because you will rationalize doing the very thing that you know you ought not do. So let's cast down arguments. Let's cast down every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Let's bring, into thought, bring every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Okay, frankly, you really can't do much if you're setting a bad example yourself. You know, if you're setting a bad example, then how are you going to deal with, with problems that other people have? You got to get the plank out of your own eye, right? Before you can help anyone else. So it's very critically important that we learn to cast down these imaginations and every high thing, proud thing that exalts itself, we need to bring every thought into captivity unto the obedience of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now let's go to Romans chapter 13, which is another powerful scripture. I, I find 2 Corinthians 10 a very powerful scripture to help us deal with addictions. Romans chapter 13 is another one because it tells us what we need to be doing. And if we're not doing this, then as it says, we're making provision for the flesh. If we put ourselves in compromising situations, then we make provisions for the flesh. Romans chapter 13, verse 14. In fact, let's go back to verse 11 and let's read it in context. Romans chapter 13, verse 11. 
and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Now Paul said this and this was valid. This was a valid point because frankly, none of us know how long we're going to live. None of us know when we will meet our maker, so to speak. None of us do. Now Paul was under the impression that Christ was going to come back much sooner. I mean, this was what? Close to 2,000 years ago that this was written. Over 1,900 years ago. And Paul was wrong thinking that Christ was coming back right away. Christ did not come back right away. Uh, we're nearly 2,000 years closer to the return of Christ. How much more should this apply to us now? I mean, we are definitely getting closer. Things are happening very quickly these days. Knowledge has increased. The prophecy in Daniel is being fulfilled. And so we're drawing ever closer to the return of Christ. So we should take this more seriously in some ways than than those in Paul's time, although they, they needed to take it seriously too because we don't know when we're going to die. And they all died. None of them are living today. They all died. So he said it's high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off. See, the conclusion is because we're drawing ever closer to the return of our Savior, Jesus Christ, let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light. Okay, the church at Rome, the church at Corinth, the church at Philippi, Thessalonica, these were real human beings, and real human beings have problems. No matter where they live, no matter what age they live in. So he knew that there were people sitting in that congregation who were doing works of darkness. They were not yet perfect. They had not yet put sin completely out of their lives. So let us cast off the works of darkness. Let us put on the armor of light and let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust. Some of them were involved in lewdness. They were in, involved in lust and revelry and drunkenness, not in strife and envy. We see people today in God's church that struggle with these same things. Verse 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So point five and six Again, they're covered here. We are to draw near to God, and he will draw near to us. We are to resist Satan. He will flee from us. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Okay, that's the point I really wanted to bring out. Sometimes we make provision for the flesh. Now, we, instead of staying as far away from something as we possibly can, we want to see how close we can get thinking we'll have the strength to say no. But the closer we get, the harder it is to say no. So the principle is pull away from it. Get as far away as you possibly can. Do not make provision for the flesh. No, mon no wonder we can't overcome these things because we are making provision for the flesh. So you have to be on guard and make wise choices so that you do not make provision for the flesh. You know, I, I'm not picking on anyone specifically at all today. I don't have anyone in mind. <laughs> but if gossip is an issue in your life, then you might have to be careful who you hang around. Because if you're hanging around all the gossips in town, then that's going to rub off on you. If when you go to the beauty salon and everyone around you is gossiping, then it's much easier to get into that spirit. And that's a wrong spirit. And it's true with anything, you know, anything in life, any evil thing. If we, you know, that's why God says to, to pull away from people who are adulterers or adulteresses and that type of thing. You know, don't get involved with, with that. Make no provision for the flesh. So are you still working hard and eating right spiritually? You know, since we first started this sermon, have you been working hard and eating right spiritually? Or are you putting negative selfish thoughts, unhealthy junk food entertainment? Now, that's a, there's a lot of entertainment in the world these days. 
and not all of it is suitable for human consumption. <laughs> I mean, there's a ton of it out there that is unsuitable. So you have to be careful the choices that you make. So stay away from these spiritual weight gaining foods. Don't bring them into your minds and into your hearts. Don't meditate on spiritually harmful things. Uh, you know, if you have a problem with lust, don't sit around dwelling on the object of your lust. You know, you have to say no. You have to pull away from that. You know, if you have a problem with lusting, you don't want to pick up girly magazines. You know, you don't want to pick up even the, the magazines that aren't considered so girly, and yet there's a lot of stuff in there. You know, they may not be the worst, but they may be unhealthy for you. So make no provision for the flesh. Um, don't meditate on spiritually harmful things. Keep your thoughts out of the gutter and the cesspool of life. I remember one of the contestants saying, she said, I lost more than weight. I also lost emotional and mental baggage. There's all kinds of emotional and mental baggage that we all need to lose. The sixth step on the road to eternal life and to becoming a big loser is to avoid and to resist all bad, sinful thoughts and actions. That's principle number six. Avoid it. Avoid these things. Now let's go on to the last, the final principle in putting sin out of our lives. And that is to draw strength from your spiritual family. Now we started with point number one, which was to follow your coaches, both certainly God and Christ, but also human leaders who are also following Christ and setting a good example for you. Now, point number seven is related to the first point, but it goes a little bit further in some ways. Draw strength, draw strength from your entire spiritual family. The first point was mainly the leaders in, in you know, God and Jesus Christ and also the human leaders, you know, those who speak to you that that give sermons and sermonettes and so forth the ones that god is using to teach you and to guide you but frankly we are all in this together and we are all god's family and we can learn from each other ministers can learn from members members can learn from ministers you know we can learn from each other so we need to benefit from friends of like mind who love us and have our best spiritual interest in mind. So that includes everyone in this room. You know, I consider all of you my brothers and sisters in Christ. I can learn from you. I can be benefited by my association with you. So I want to draw sp strength from my spiritual family. Every Sabbath, I look forward to coming here and getting together with all of you. And so it's very, very important that we look at each other in this way. We're all in this together. We, we, we feed off each other in many respects. So we need to draw close to each other, just like on the Biggest Loser program, they draw close to each other, uh, knowing, that they, knowing that they all have something that goes beyond what team, physical team they're on. Not only do they grow close to each other, but to the trainers also. So it's a, it's a complete family operation here, you might say. So in Mark chapter 10, let's go there for a moment. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10, verse 28. Mark chapter 10, verse 28. Mark 10, verse 28. Then Peter began to say to him, to Christ, see, we have left all and we followed you. Now that's what we've done as well, isn't it? We've, we've left everything, we followed Christ. So Jesus answered and said in verse 29, assuredly I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brothers or sisters or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake and the gospels who shall not receive a hundredfold now in this time. So we have lots of brothers and sisters, mothers, fathers in the faith. So God has given us each other. You know, we have each other that we are to, to learn from and to draw from. And it, it does say that there will be persecutions and we need each other to stick together and to battle against the ways of Satan, the devil, who will try to persecute us. 
It says, and in the age to come, eternal life. You know, God is going to give us eternal life. But now we live here in the flesh. Frankly, we need to learn from each other. So we come together with others of like mind. We have the same goals. We want camaraderie. We want support. We want encouragement from each other. And so we have a responsibility to give that to each other, to encourage each other, to support each other, to be friends, to be friendly. Uh, this is a very friendly congregation. It's a small congregation. Uh, you've had to pretty much pull together and you've done a marvelous job of doing that. So as we grow larger though, it needs to be infectious. You know, what you have now needs to infect everyone who walks through the door. So if there's anything that we need to, to deal with now, we need to deal with it so that we will be better examples as God gives us more growth. Because I have a feeling God is going to help us grow in the future. If we will be pleasing to him, then he's going to help us grow. There are many principles in the Bible that, that say that to us. So I don't think God's done with us yet. I personally believe we're going to see some growth. And I hope we are going to be ready for that growth. There's plenty of room in here. We could, you know, we could go this way. We could talk to the whole, you know, to the whole filled congregation. Uh, so we have to have faith that God will work in us and through us, but we, we do need to become a church without spot or wrinkle or any such thing. So uh, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, let's go there and let's consider a, a very important principle here. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14. We'll just, uh, I think, cover one verse here. Verse, and you're familiar with this principle. Is that right? 2 Corinthians 6. I think that's wrong. Maybe it's 1 Corinthians 6. Did I write it down wrong? Uh... That's not even, it's, it's actually 1 Corinthians 6. Um, yeah, I should know where this is. Just a moment here. Oh. It's 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. <laughs> I don't know where I was. I was in the wrong place for some reason. But 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14. Do not be unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship has righteousness with lawlessness? What communion has light with darkness? Okay, these are questions that God is, is, that Paul is asking on God's behalf, you might say. We should not become unequally yoked together with an unbeliever. Okay, uh, it's very important that we strengthen our spiritual family by choosing those who will be the best fit for us, someone who believes the same as we do. Now, we don't have, you know, anyone here today that we necessarily have to admonish in this way, but it is important not to be unequally yoked with an unbeliever. It's an important principle. The seventh step in the process of conversion and in losing weight is to continually draw strength from your spiritual family. So we need to, to build our sp spiritual family. Uh, we need to draw close together. Again, we need to, to be here for each other. So these seven principles are important principles. If we will follow them, surely we will continue to put sin out of our lives and we will be able to maintain. Now I wanna go back to Hebrews chapter 12 where we started as we draw, draw to the end of this sermon, this series of sermons, we've talked three different times about this topic. In Hebrews chapter 12, verse one, Hebrews chapter 12, verse one. Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. And let's look unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand 
of the throne of God. You know, Christ is the author. He is the finisher of our faith. And we need to consider that great cloud of witnesses that has come before us. You know, it's interesting that when the 15 contestants that enter the great the gate of the Biggest Loser Ranch for the very first time, they walk down a walled street. And covering the wall on both sides are banners with the names and the total weight losses of all the Biggest Losers from the past. So these people are just getting started, but they're walking down this hallway and they're seeing what has been accomplished before them. Those past contestants stand as light and inspiration that the goal before these new contestants is not unattainable. Uh, they were all very heavy when they started the program. They were all big losers. Now these banners represent the lives of these people. It represents their examples. The stories of their battles, their struggles, their setbacks, their ultimate success come into the minds of the present contestants. You can be sure that a lot of those contestants watched those programs in the past. You know, they saw the inspiration that came and they decided they could do it too. So they applied to this, uh, to the program. So they have their wall of greats, but we have our wall of greats from a spiritual standpoint. Now you can sense their admiration and their excitement as they realize that they have the same opportunity to accomplish great changes in their lives. Looking at the people that have become their heroes from just watching a TV show, uh, they share vicariously in the, in the lives of these people that overcame, that put off the physical weight and became great losers. So they're inspired to walk forward and start their journey laying aside the weight that ensnared them. And they are ready to run with endurance to accomplish their goals. So the cloud of witnesses in Hebrews 12 that we referred to is our Christian wall of greats. We're not going to go to Hebrews 11, but there it mentions Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and even Rahab and Samson and Jephthah. These are all examples for us who overcame, who became big losers, who put the sin out of their lives by following these seven principles that we've been talking about today. And without us, it says they should not be made perfect. See, so we are a part of that. They have not yet received the promises. They are awaiting all of us. When Christ returns, the first fruits, first fruits will be raised. Those who are alive will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye. So we are awaiting Christ's return. All of us are awaiting. There's a great cloud of witnesses that have come before us, but they're also waiting for us. You know, we have something in common with all of those who have come before us. The ups and downs of their lives that are revealed in the Bible and their eventual victory through Christ should inspire us to shed our sinful weight so that we can run with endurance to the end as they have done. The goal is ultimately becoming like the glorified Christ at his resurrection. That is our goal. It is he who, it is he who we must fix our eyes on and focus upon in order to arrive at the finish line where we will all become big winners as we enter God's kingdom. So brethren, as we approach the, the, the Pentecost, you know, the day of Pentecost, we're what, 42 or three days away now. And without stopping and thinking, it's somewhere like that. Uh, let us be extremely grateful to God and Christ for our calling and for God's wonderful plan of salvation for us and for all of mankind. We know fully that we are indeed saved by grace. We are not saved by our own efforts. This is not a pull your up by your bootstraps sermon. You know, we have to rely on God to give us the strength to obey and to follow these seven principles that we've talked about. God has to live in us. So we are saved by grace. Christ is the one and only perfect sacrifice he is our Passover lamb that enables us to escape death and to come out of sin, to come out of bondage and slavery. Satan would like to brutally keep you in bondage. So brethren, let us continue to examine ourselves. We've been told to examine ourselves before Passover. Let us continue to examine ourselves and let us continue to repent of our sins. Let's follow these seven principles 
and let's put sin out of our lives. And next year at this time before Passover, we will look back and we will, we will see that with God's help, we overcame. You know, we are stronger spiritually because we've applied these seven principles. So brethren, let, let us all become big losers in this life.